A few months ago, I passed the AWS Developer Associate exam. Do you need any previous certifications? How long should you spend studying? What resources should you use? And how should you use them? What should you do on the day of the exam? Stay tuned because I'm going to be covering all of these in this video. Now, a quick background about me. I'm currently an AWS DevOps engineer in the financial services industry, working in London. At the time of the exam, I had about six months of experience. However, although I think it would help, I don't think you necessarily need any professional experience to be able to do this exam. In fact, for any current students or recent graduates or or anyone looking to transition into the cloud industry, I think this certification will be really beneficial. I don't have a background in computer science. I didn't study it at university or any related topics at university. And before getting my current role, I had no other previous professional experience in software engineering, IT or cloud. Do you need any previous certifications? Technically, no, but it's generally recommended within the AWS community to at least do the Solutions Architect Associate before trying to do the developer. And I would generally agree. The Solutions Architect Associate provides a broad view of all of the AWS services and how they interact with each other. And it's considered to be the core certification that you should get among the associates before really attempting any of the others. The developer associate relies heavily on the content covered by the Solutions Architect. So it makes sense to do both. However, you don't have to study for both individually. There is a huge amount of overlap between the two certifications. In fact, take a look at this visualization that shows the overlapping content between Adrian Cantrell's Solutions Architect Associate course and his developer course. I'll talk a bit more about these resources later on in the video, but for now, just focus on the overlap. 81% of the content is shared. So it really does make sense to do both if you can. What I did was to try and study for both courses at the same time and then take the exam within a few weeks of each other. And I would recommend doing this too if you don't already have the Solutions Architect Associate. However, if you're a beginner and you're only interested in doing the Developer Associate, it's still possible with the resources that I'm going to highlight later on in the video. How much time should you spend on the exam? There are two ways that I think you could approach this. Trying to do this as fast as possible or really taking your time to go through a long form course. For most beginners, I probably recommend not trying to speed run the certification as fast as possible. The problem with this route is that you're going to be focused on memorizing facts and exam pattern recognition just for the sake of passing the exam. And that's not where the real value of this certification is. As an engineer, you could just Google the facts and figures when you need them. So they're not really important to memorize. The value of the certification comes from getting you to problem solve and think like a real developer and gain true AWS knowledge. The certification itself should come as a natural result from all of the real world skills and theory that you've learned. Instead, I would recommend taking your time to really understand the material. How long does this take? Well, it really depends on your current level of knowledge and how much time you're willing to put into your studies. For me, as a beginner to cloud computing and software engineering, it took me around four months to pass both the Solutions Architects Associate and the developer exams. I'd like to think I probably averaged around two hours of studying per day. Although, to be honest, I think most of it was done in bursts over certain days. Now, I would recommend against this if you can. I think it's better to be consistent over a period of time, but hey, Life gets in the way sometimes. Resources. I mainly use two resources to study. Both will be linked below. Adrian Cantrell's Developer Associate course and Tutorial Dojo's practice exams. Optionally, if you don't already have the Solutions Architect Associate, you can buy Adrian's Solutions Architect Associate course. There's a lot of overlap between his two courses and Adrian highlights this in his title, so you know which topics to skip. Now, most of my time was spent going through Adrian's course. It's very, very long, over 50 hours and extremely detailed, which I think for a beginner is probably a good thing. I'm a very visual learner, so I found that Adrian's diagrams and animations and his general way of explaining things was very helpful for me. But what I liked most about this course is that it's really pitched at beginners. It requires no prerequisite knowledge and doesn't assume that you've already done any experience or a degree in computer science. If you're on the fence, I would recommend checking out his AWS Fundamental series on YouTube. Coming in without a computer science or IT background, I'd never really learned about topics like networking or encryption. So I really spent a lot of time reviewing Adrian's Fundamental series before I moved on with the rest of the course. And I would recommend beginners to do the same. Review Adrian's videos, watch YouTube videos, read articles. Trust me, not only will this make the exam easier, you'll also stand out as a good candidate in any job interviews that you get. I think it's good to reach a point where you can comfortably explain these fundamental topics to a friend or family member that has absolutely no knowledge of computer science. And actually try this. I think it's a great way to figure out where your knowledge gaps are. Now, when I went through the rest of the course, I didn't really take any notes at least not in the traditional way. Traditional note taking where you're kind of just regurgitating what the lecture says and then highlighting certain bits of information. It's not really an effective way to study. Instead, I would recommend at the end of each video, writing down questions and answers that you've learnt so you can test yourself periodically. Research has shown that this is a much better study method. And if you take away just one thing from this video, 
please let it be this. Test yourself as often as possible. For example, when I was learning about DynamoDB, I wrote myself this question. How does DynamoDB replicate across availability zones? And wrote an answer based on what I've learned. I store all of my questions and answers in this free tool called Anki. The benefit of using this tool is that it'll automatically tell you when you should review your questions. Aside from the theory, I also did all of the practical labs in Adrian's course. The labs are really useful because they replicate what you'll be doing with AWS in the real world. What I found is that when I'm doing the exam or when I'm talking to colleagues about certain services, I have a much better understanding of those services if I've actually used them in practice. Again, these real world skills are what you should be aiming to get with this certification. Now, I particularly recommend focusing on DynamoDB and X-Ray, as these areas seem to come up a lot in the practice exams and the real exam. After I finished with the course, I started testing myself with Tutorial Dojo's practice exams. Tutorial Dojo's exams are very popular among people studying for AWS certifications, and for good reason. They have a huge question bank. And if you get a question wrong, there's a detailed explanation as to why you got it wrong and what the correct answer is. This is especially useful for those questions where more than one answer can technically be correct, but one answer is favored over the other because it's more relevant to what's being asked in the question. These type of questions tend to come up a lot in the developer exams, so it's good to get the practice in. For any questions that I got wrong during the practice exams, I would learn why I got them wrong and then put them back into Anki so I don't forget. Now, I should add that the tutorial dojo practice exams are actually slightly harder than the real exam. So don't don't be disheartened if you're not getting a really high score. For reference, these are my scores for the review mode practice exams that I took before I felt ready to take the real exam. Exam tips. In terms of booking the exam, I found availability was quite good for any dates that I wanted, but I would still recommend booking in advance if there's a particular date and time that you want. If the time you want isn't available when you check, make sure that you keep refreshing and checking on different days because availability does pop up when people cancel. On the day of the exam, Make sure that you've done the system check that's sent to your email to make sure that your laptop is compatible with their exam software. Try and do the exam in the most boring room possible. What I mean by this is the room with the least amount of stuff in it. Ideally, just a desk and a chair. When the exam starts, the examiner will do a pre-exam check where they'll ask you to take pictures of the room that you're doing the exam in. If they find anything even slightly suspicious or have any reason to think that you could be using something in the room to cheat, they could ask you to move to a different room. This can be a real hassle if you're in a room full of clutter and they ask you to move all of it to a different room. Trust me, it's happened to me. Also, try and limit the amount of sound that's coming into the room. During the exam, your microphone is on and you're being recorded. If there's anyone in your house talking in the background or any other kind of background noise, it could give the examiner reason to think that they're communicating with you and helping you cheat. In the worst case, this could lead them to investigate further and potentially disqualify you. Now, luckily, this is relatively rare, but it's still worthwhile trying to minimize the risk. In terms of the actual exam, I didn't do anything too fancy. I went through all of the questions one by one and any that I wasn't completely sure about or if I spent a lot of time thinking about a certain question, I would flag it to review when, when I finished the exam. I would say that for me, the 130 minute time limit wasn't too much of an issue. I think most people finish with a bit of time to spare, but do keep an eye on the timer if you know that you spent a long time on a particular question. Now, AWS doesn't give you the result instantly because they take some time to check over your exam footage to check for any cheating. I found out the result of my exam about 20 hours after I submitted it. This varies for a lot of people. Some people sooner, some people later. Later. I think the average is around 24 hours. But don't worry if your result is pending for longer than 24 hours. It doesn't mean that AWS are necessarily investigating your exam or that you failed. For some people, I've seen it take up to three days, so don't worry. Good luck on the exam. And if you found this video useful, please consider subscribing. As a small content creator, it really does help.